Next, on AM 1480 WLEA, the Newsmaker Show. Here's Ryan O'Neill. On this Wednesday, December 18th, 2019, we have with us, and just seven days till Christmas, I think, uh, we have with us uh, Alfred State History Professor of European History, Dr. Nick Waddy. I'm very anxious to get his thoughts on the Boris Johnson victory. Dr. Waddy, thanks for joining us. Oh, thank you for having me, Brian. So what do you think? Well, Brian, I think it's great. I think Great Britain is, is greater than ever. And, uh, you know, this is going to portend, as I've said before, a stronger relationship between the United States and, and the United Kingdom. I think it could portend real trouble for the European Union because now we know for sure that Britain is going to leave the EU. And people have been predicting doom for Britain ever since. It hasn't come to pass. And my opinion is that when Britain leaves, as Britain leaves, it will prosper and find great opportunities uh, to uh, reconnect with its former colonies, places like Canada and Australia, and, um, and with the U.S. So I think this is a sea change, and it's certainly a, a major blow for socialism because Jeremy Corbyn, the Labour candidate for prime minister, was a true socialist. He made no bones about it, and, uh, and uh, he has been soundly defeated. Dr. Waddy, I was talking about this with Dr. Ostrower yesterday. I was looking up the ratings for Sky News, which is owned by Fox News here in America. And I was reading the ratings for Sky News versus the BBC. BBC is ahead of uh, Sky News in terms of viewership, but only by a couple million. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I watched the Sky News coverage the night of the election. It was a lot of fun. Um, but, you know, I, that was the first time I'd ever watched Sky News. It didn't strike me as being particularly partisan or strident. Uh, you know, people always say Fox News is uh, full of propaganda. That's certainly what people on the left say. I don't think they watch because it's it's uh, it bears a striking resemblance to the news, as, as far as I can tell. Um so uh, yeah, it doesn't surprise me that the BBC is ahead because they, they just don't have many channels. They're not as uh, cable oriented and they don't have such the, all the proliferation of 24 hour news channels. The BBC doesn't have a lot of competition in Britain. And I think it does strive for a level of professionalism that uh, much of our mainstream media falls short of. Yeah, it's just I find it interesting that that many people in England uh, tune in to uh Sky News there, uh, I would have thought it would have been all the liberal media outlets, but apparently not, and that was proven by the election, Nick. Yeah, absolutely. Um, the conservatives got about 44% of the vote, but in England, which is you know the vast majority of the United Kingdom, they got 47% of the vote. They really, uh, I think they defeated the, uh, the Labor Party by 15 points. It wasn't close, and... The big takeaway from this election is that a lot of seats that have been in labor hands for a hundred years, you know, working class communities in, in the Midlands and in Wales, and they went conservative. Uh, and the big reason, I guess there are two reasons. Well, yeah, let's say three reasons. The, the appeal of Boris Johnson, who's a populist conservative, the lack of appeal of Jeremy Corbyn, who's an elitist and, and a very acidic style of, of socialist, not a very appealing character. And lastly, Brexit. Uh, many of these communities voted for Brexit. They believe in Brexit. And for three years, the political establishment has been dragging its feet, trying to undermine the people's will. And they were sick of it. And Boris Johnson offered uh, an opportunity to get Brexit done. And they took it. How much of this do you attribute, uh, as far as the Boris Johnson victory goes, to uh, Trump here in the USA and the this movement that's apparently catching on worldwide of uh, people that subscribe to what Trump believes. Mm -hmm. Well, there are similarities between Boris Johnson and Donald Trump, and people have remarked on those. There are also substantial differences. Boris Johnson is more of a career politician. He's a lot more polished. He avoids some of the unforced errors that Donald Trump makes. Um, but he is brash, and um, and he, he, he can make some politically incorrect statements at times. He's certainly a populist. He's an, uh, against the global elite, and he had the audacity to get on board with Brexit at a very early stage and help lead the fight for Brexit, which was totally anathema to the, to the British political elite. 
So they have a lot of things in common. But the truth is, as I've said before, that Donald Trump is not a popular figure for most people in Britain. So Boris Johnson was not elected because he's Boris, because he's Donald Trump's best friend. In fact, he put a little distance wisely between himself and Donald Trump right before the election. And that's fair enough. You know, Boris Johnson isn't a carbon copy of Trump, but he will be an ally of Trump and he will even more importantly, be an ally of the United States. Talking to Alfred State History Professor Dr. Nick Waddy, as we always do on a Wednesday, Dr. Waddy. Uh, I thought uh, I thought you'd be interested in this clip from Sean Hannity, who's been railing against uh, Jim Comey, the former FBI head. In and this is uh, because of the uh, IG report that came out recently. Here's what uh, Hannity said about Comey. So he finally admits, "Well, I was wrong this weekend." And he's talking about, uh, specifically, he's Hannity here talking about uh, Comey's appearance on Fox News Sunday with Chris Wallace. So he finally admits, well, I was wrong this weekend. I was wrong. Oh, oh, you think that does it, Jim? Really? You just get to say, no, I was, I was finally admit, I have to admit I was wrong here. Uh, if you think that's going to cut it, I don't think that's going to cut it at all. Okay, and here's what uh, John Batchelor says. The FBI just showed us everything that's wrong with it. It's like the Horowitz report is a, a what's wrong with FISA for dummies. Well, John, I don't think that FISA deserves to be reassembled, if, if even if that were possible, because I, I've always thought it was a wrongheaded idea to begin with, uh, mainly because uh, – the decisions that go to national security, to the collection of foreign intelligence information and the protection of the country are in, are political decisions in nature. I don't mean that in the derogatory way that we refer to politics. I'm talking about distinguishing as a constitutional matter political responsibilities from judicial responsibilities. The protection of the United States is a political is a responsibility of the political branches and as justice uh, robert jackson said in the post world war ii opinion those decisions that these decisions about national security that uh that a body politic makes you want those decisions to be made by the people who answer to the voters whose lives are at stake and if you transfer them to the judiciary, who are the non-political actors who are insulated from accountability in our system, what you inevitably get is bad national security choices that ratchet up due process and other protections for people who are trying to harm the country. So, Andy McCarthy said a lot there from the John Bachelor show, and then uh, we had John Bachelor, we had Sean Hannity before that. So you have a lot to react to there, Doctor Waddy. Yeah, I, I guess. Uh, my first reaction is that I disagree because I think the basic concept of the FISA court is that it's supposed to protect, I'm not sure how much it's supposed to protect foreigners, but it's supposed certainly supposed to protect American citizens from being inadvertently or even intentionally spied upon by the FBI or the CIA or whoever, I suppose it's this, the FBI normally that's uh, requesting a warrant. And I think that's good. I, I'm not sure we do want politicians deciding when it's acceptable to spy on both foreigners and Americans. So that seems like a, a constitutional issue, uh, an issue of civil rights that you would want to put before a judge. And that would be a layer of protection for the American people and people like Donald Trump who were unnecessarily and unjustly spied upon in 2016 in this case and, and beyond. Um, so I think the, the concept of the FISA court is a good one. What we've seen, though, is that there's a, apparently a cozy relationship between the Department of Justice and the FISA court, and it's almost unheard of for the FISA court to turn down a request by the Department of Justice, and that's a problem. Uh, clearly, there needs to be more critical thinking in this process so that it actually works to protect the rights of the American people. I want to replay something that Andy McCarthy said in that last song by the way. I want to replay uh, what he said because I think he's kind of slamming the courts here. And if you transfer them to the judiciary, who are the non-political actors who are insulated from accountability in our system, what you inevitably get is bad national security. <laughs> 
He just said a lot there, Dr. Waddy. When you take the power that should be in the hands of Congress and the president and put it in the power of the courts, now you're stepping into it. Well, and again, I, I would disagree because I think the most important function of the courts is to uphold the Constitution and uphold our rights as Americans. And politicians can't always do that, and they won't always do that. I, you know, to follow his logic, you could say, well, Comey uh, and, you know, his boss, Obama, sought these FISA warrants. So ultimately, if uh, we want to hold Comey and thus Obama responsible, well, then we could vote them out of office or we could impeach them. And that's true. But those are very imperfect and political processes. And given the nature of the mainstream media, I think it's very possible that all the people who perpetrated uh, this uh, this espionage and this this uh, this vendetta against Donald Trump, that all of them will escape uh, any meaningful punishment. Uh, that that's that's profoundly distressing. But given the nature of politics, it could easily happen. Here's Rush Limbaugh on the topic of Comey. The first application for a FISA warrant to spy on Carter Page contains seven significant inaccuracies and omissions. Among them, among these significant inaccuracies and om inaccuracies and omissions, the FBI concealed that Carter Page had been working with the CIA in his dealings with Russia and that Page had notified CIA case managers of at least some of those contacts after he was approved as an operational contact with Russia. In other words, they're getting a warrant to spy on somebody in the Trump campaign they claim is working for Trump colluding with Russia who was actually a CIA operative working for the United States. They knew that. Dr. Wadi. Yeah, I mean, uh, we can't even count the number of ways that, that the, uh, that the uh, uh, spying on Carter Page and the, the justification for it were, were a joke. I mean, it, it is hard to believe that intelligent people could have swallowed this notion that Carter Page was some agent of the Russians and he was burrowing into the Trump campaign and the Trump campaign was working hand in glove with the Russians. The evidence has been incredibly thin, but the truth is that a lot of intelligent people still believe it. So I guess it is possible. Uh, and what it shows us is that if you are determined to believe the worst about someone, then you will, um, the, the thinnest of evidence will be persuasive to you. And since that is um, apparently the case in our political system, the voters and elected officials are incredibly credulous when it comes to uh, negative claims against someone like Donald Trump. Really, the only way that we're going to get any, any satisfaction in this case is from the courts. Ultimately, um, if, if laws were broken, then uh, the people who, who broke them need to be held accountable, and only the courts can do that. Basically, we need the courts to serve as a referee in this, in this battle to the death between the left and the right that's taking place in this country. And if we can't trust the courts, then who can we trust? Talking to uh, Alfred State History Professor Dr. Nick Wadi. We're going to take a quick break. We'll be back and we'll talk this day in history. Dr. Wadi, on this day in history, December 18th, 1620, the Mayflower lands at Plymouth Harbor. Yeah, and of course, the, the great debate uh, is uh, raging now among American historians. Do we focus on 1619, the introduction of slavery into the Americas and uh, the history of racism in America? Is that the seminal moment that we want to uh, to focus on? Or do we, do we look at, say, the, the landing of the pilgrims at Plymouth Rock uh, or, um, and, the, and the settlement of, of the United States, the, uh, the War of Independence, the, the gradual extension of, of rights and opportunities to more and more Americans? In other words, do we want to spin American history as a positive or, or a negative story? And that, that, uh, that debate is, is raging. Also on this date in history... Uh, slavery abolished with the 13th Amendment in 1865. And this goes to the same question. You know, this this is a country that 
held millions of people in bondage, and that will always be true, and we will always have to deal with that as a country. But this is also a country that has pioneered the extension of rights uh, to more and more people. And, you know, the, the world today believes in liberty. It believes in equality. <clears throat> it believes in constitutionalism. It believes in popular representation in government. It believes in equality before the law. And the number one reason that it believes in these things is because the United States of America, a very powerful country, took up this this banner and um, made these values um, popular throughout the world and certainly successful within our own borders. So, you know, to my mind, it's, it's a slam dunk case for a uh, a positive reading of U.S. history and the progress that we've made, uh, and I'm I'm sorry that so many people on the left are inclined to accentuate the negative. But given that they continue to despise what America is and want to transform it into something else, it's understandable. Doctor Wadi, also on this day in history, uh, I'm sure if any Alstom executives from France. Are listening? They'll laugh at my pronunciation. It's a, a World War One battle. Is it Verdun, Verdu, Verdun? Verdun, I think is how it's <laughs> usually said. Yeah. Okay. Uh, the longest engagement of World War One ends on this day after ten months and a million casualties in World War One suffered by the French and the Germans. The battle began uh, February twenty first and uh, was led by. Uh, a German uh, chief who uh, attacked Verdun, uh, believing that the French army was more vulnerable than the British and that uh, a major defeat on the Western Front would push the Allies to open peace negotiations. That, of course, I'm getting from the uh, History Channel's website. Dr. Wadi, do you want to weigh in? Yeah, the, the, there are two big battles that take place on the Western Front in 1916, the Battle of Verdun and the Battle of the Somme. And they're both sort of the classic World War I battles in that they were massive. They involved enormous loss of life. Uh, and in some cases, the introduction of, of new technologies, the flamethrower in Battle of Verdun and the, the tank at the Battle of the Somme. But um, the upshot of both of these battles is that neither side makes significant territorial gains. The strategic situation in the war is unchanged. And, um, you know, hundreds of thousands of people are dead and, and millions are injured. So it, it drives home the tragedy of World War I. And uh, you may know, Brian, that there's a, there's a major motion picture coming out uh, called 1917, which is set in World War I, and that will refocus people's attention on World War I a little bit. Um, so uh, I, th I think, the again, the big takeaway of the Battle of Verdun is that it, um, it evokes the tragedy of World War I, that is, that so many people died and so many people lost limbs and, and were scarred psychologically by the horror of the fighting, and most of that fighting accomplished virtually nothing. Fast forwarding to 1972, December 18th, 1972, President Richard Nixon announces the start of the Christmas bombing of North Vietnam. And uh, reading from the History Channel's uh, website, following the breakdown of peace talks with North Vietnam just a few days earlier in 1972, President Nixon announced the beginning of a massing, massive bombing campaign to break the stalemate, and for nearly two weeks, the American bombers pounded North Vietnam. Mm -hmm. And, of course, it's called the Christmas bombing, partly because it occurred around Christmas, but also because the American media wanted to cast Richard Nixon as sort of the anti-Santa, if you will, the, uh, the antithesis of the Christmas spirit delivering death and destruction to the people of North Vietnam. But he did it for a good reason. We've talked about it before. It was necessary to drive the North Vietnamese uh, back to the peace table. It worked. We did get a peace agreement. We set up the conditions for a U.S. and South Vietnamese victory in the Vietnam War. Unfortunately, Nixon left office and uh, his successor, Gerald Ford, and more importantly, the Democratic Congress refused to continue the support to South Vietnam, and it, it eventually fell to the North. But, um, you know, the, uh, basically what President Nixon was doing in the, in the Christmas bombing was he was using force 
the only language that the North Vietnamese understood to explain to them that the United States was committed and it would do whatever it took to defend the independence of South Vietnam. Uh, as long as President Nixon was president, that was true. And they needed to accept the inevitable and, uh, and um, agree to peace. Skipping around here, going back to 1915, Woodrow Wilson, uh, President Wilson, in 1915, marries a woman named Edith Galt. She was 43, he was 59, and uh, his first wife had apparently died uh, from uh, kidney problems the year before. And they say that uh, unlike Wilson's first wife, who was shy and avoided politics, Edith, the second wife, shared Woodrow Wilson's passion for the subject of politics. And uh, what do we know? What else do we know about uh, Woodrow Wilson or his wife there, Dr. Waddy? Well, I don't know much about his wife, Brian, but he is a very interesting figure. He's the only U.S. president to have been uh, president of a college and to have a Ph.D. He was an academic, and uh, I say that with some some regret because he's I don't think he's a great credit to academia or or to the U.S. presidency uh you know if you looked at the grand sweep of the 20th century and all the the carnage and and death and and tragedy of it um you could ask where it went wrong and and you could pinpoint a lot of places where it where it arguably did go wrong but I think um World War One and the aftermath of World War One was catastrophically mismanaged and more than anyone else it was Woodrow Wilson who mismanaged it he constructed a new order in Europe based on the Treaty of Versailles and based on the Paris Peace Agreement based on the creation of a whole bunch of new states in Eastern Europe that was fatally flawed and and sowed the seeds for for World War II and um, you know he tried to pull us into the League of Nations and to get us to abandon our our traditional policy of isolationism it didn't work in the short run uh, he was an idealist and not a realist, and there's a, there's always a tension in in foreign policy and and in politics between realism and idealism. And to me, he's a classic example of of someone who, on a theoretical level, on an academic level, I'm sure he was brilliant, but on a practical level, I think his his presidency was a disaster. Dr. Nick Wadi, a European history professor at Alfred State College, as always, uh, thank you so much for coming on. Thank you, Brian. And uh, next week we'll have on uh, repeats of the uh, old Kevin Doran show. Oh, by the way, uh, for our listeners, uh, and you might want to check this out too, Dr. Nick Wadi, tomorrow on the Newsmaker Show, in segment one, it'll be PC Mag's. Eric Griffith in segment two, Bill O'Reilly. So we hope everybody tunes in. And thanks so much for joining us, Dr. Wadi. Thank you, Brian. I'll, I'll be listening tomorrow for sure.